Thank you very much for joining us here this afternoon. And uh, this is a really, really cool, cool opportunity tonight because we have with us Ed Kelly, who's the vineyard manager of Silwater Creek Vineyard, which is located up on uh, the Royal Slope in uh, really just about the center part of uh, Washington State. So it's just east of uh, Vantage. And uh, that vineyard is just about the highest vineyard on the Frenchman Hills. Ed, I'm so happy he's here because uh, he knows more about vineyards than any other person I know on earth. It, tonight, we're gonna be tasting our uh, 2019 uh, Helix Angiovese Rosé from Stillwater Creek Vineyard, and also our 2018 Sangiovese uh, from Stillwater Creek Vineyard. Both these wines come from the same block. Ed, can you please uh, introduce yourself? Boy, Ed, you wanna tell us a little bit about your background and uh, how you got to Stillwater Creek? Sure. I, um, at UC Davis, I originally got my degree in plant pathology and I worked for the department, of, California Department of Food and Ag as a plant pathologist in the mycology department. And part of that process was looking at the Dutch elm disease. And one day I was called out to Francis Ford Coppola's Nebaum estate in the Napa Valley, check out a big stately elm tree of his and looking around his vineyards and thinking it's mighty nice out here because I was working out of downtown Sacramento and I grew up not very far from Napa in a town called Leo. Well, anyway, to, after talking to the vineyard manager, I went back to Sacramento and said, I'd rather do this. So I went back to UC Davis and got my, took all their viticulture classes. And then in 1978 started working in various vineyards around the state, first in Napa, then San Luis Obispo, and down out of Southern California in Escondido. And then eventually came back to Napa where I had my first vineyard management job in 81 at Mount Veter Winery. So most of my time in Napa and Sonoma counties was in the mountains and not long after I got into it, I got into consulting because I became interested in sustainable agriculture, uh, use of non-chemicals, growing grapes. Um, and I wanted to spread the word, kind of like a, I was more of a crusader than anything at that point in time. So I spent almost 25 years consulting um, in all aspects of viticulture, from layout to management systems to, well, the whole the whole nine yards irrigation, and I guess when Chuck brought up what I said, ask Mother Nature what she do would be more related, very related to the soils, and we we have a lot of viticulture that everybody knows and above ground stuff, but the fun part of it to me also also is the soils. The soils are so important to wine quality and how you manage and work with the soils is paramount to the quality of grapes. You got to do all the above thing, ground things right. And in addition to the soil minerals, there's foliar minerals, there's drip applied minerals and all these things done well together produce the best quality grapes. And then I would say the other part of this is um, working with winemakers like Chuck. I can do so much in a vineyard. I've been doing this now for over 40 years and I'm pretty good at what I do, but I can't do my best job unless I get feedback from Chuck. He says, Ed, I like this about this year. I don't like this. And therefore I can take that information and go back and start working with the vines. I think I'd rather make changes, positive changes to grapes in the field than ask the winemaker to add unwanted things <laughs> or wanted depending on what you have to the, to the wines. The old cliche, great wines are grown, made in the vineyard. Well, it's holistic. They're made in the vineyard and they're made in the winery and they're made by the bookkeeper and they're made by Abby Clark's and all that Absolutely. stuff. Absolutely. So 
I came, I left California in 2008 and went to Oregon for a year. I'd already done a lot of consulting in Oregon and found that I wanted to grow more than Pinot Noir. <laughs> and I ended up, I found a little beautiful property up by Lake Wenatchee with a funky old hunter's cabin, very primitive, and moved up here and played around for a year and realized I have to go back to work. So I started applying for jobs and I got a call from Mike Janik over at Novelty Hill, Janik Winery, and Tom Malberg, who owns Stillwater Creek Vineyard, he and his family called me up, we met, and they hired me. So I've been working at Stillwater Creek Vineyard since 2011. So this is my ninth year here. So that's, and they haven't chased me out yet. So that's always surprises me. <laughs> <laughs> I doubt so. they will. My gosh, not if I have anything to say about it. So, so anyway, that's, that's kind of a brief history. Well, great. Well, we're going to talk a little bit about San Giovese and um, what San Giovese is and uh, what, it, what it is to me anyway. Um, and, um, you know, one of the San Giovese goes back a very long way. Um, originally, it was thought uh, to be go back as far as the Romans, but uh, Actually, there's a lot of indications that it even goes back further than that, uh, the Etruscans. So, but indigenous to the uh, Tuscany area in Italy. And uh, it's also, it's a grape that um, is known to mutate fairly easily too. Um, and uh, so there's a lot of, a lot of different clones of Sangiovese. It's Stillwater Creek Vineyard, Ed, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, the two clones that we use there are clone 19 and clone 23. And for many years, it was my understanding that uh, those two clones, uh, that your vineyard, Stillwater Creek, was the only place that had those clones for several years. Now we see it in a few other places around uh, Washington. But um, uh, talk a little bit about that uh, later too. But Generally speaking, um, you know, it can, it has, it, it can take many different shapes and forms, if you will. It can be kind of acidic and rustic. Um, it can be bold. It can be uh, lean toward lighter wines, sometimes even a lot, little oxidative. Um, and um, it all depends on the type of clone, but mostly also where it's grown and how it's grown. And uh, so, uh, generally speaking, uh, San Giovese, it's a uh, early, it's uh, breaks, well, it's early for bud break, shall I say. So a couple weeks ago, actually, when we did our very first uh, video blog here, uh, that morning I was out at the vineyard, and uh, here in Walla Walla anyway, and uh, we had full San Giovese bud break, and so it's always one of the earliest to, to break, but it's also a late ripener, so it likes a lot of heat to uh, shake out the acidity, and uh, we end up harvesting it, oh, sometime, usually uh, in like around October 10th or, or so, around there, so uh, it starts pushing uh, later into the season anyway. So it's fun because it always has wonderful colors and even flavors for a lo long time. But, and uh, she's kind of like, she kind of tempts you to, to come, come harvest me, even though uh, uh, it may be a little premature to do, do so. Uh, so, um, but, uh, so those are kind of my general comments of it. Like I say, it can be also a little rustic. Uh, it can be everything. Uh, you know, some harsh tannin, tannic aspects to it. Um, but uh, it's a great food wine. If there's anything that can be said about San Giovese, is it's a great food, food wine. And uh, like I say, it uh, just runs all over the board from rosés like we're gonna take today to Brunello di Montecinos, which are 100% San Giovese. Uh, San Giovese, because of it can be that kind of harsh, 
uh, tannins and acid sometimes. It, uh, its history is actually uh, needs, has dictated that uh, it has a, well, that you blend other uh, grapes with it. Uh, so uh, typical uh, Chianti blend would have some uh, Caniolo and Colorino in it. Uh, the seems like Merlot these days is kind of taking the place of the Caniolo. Um, but uh, anyway, so over time uh, that is that has been true. However, uh, there have been some varietals or clones such as Sangio Grosso, uh, which uh, I should say Sangio Vese Grosso, uh, which is the Brunello clone. It's uh, uh, anyway, it can be awfully bold and uh, uh, and made to seller and age anyway. So uh, we're most, a lot of uh, Sangio Vese's will only sell her say four to seven years around there. So, um, those, like I say, are the general comments I want to make about it. And uh, so if anybody uh, has any questions or want to chime in, feel, feel free to. Uh, just so we don't uh, make this go super late here, um, I'm going to jump in with the uh, rosé. Here we go. And tell you a little bit about our 2019 uh, Helix rosé. And actually, I don't have, that was my glass of water. So. So we're going to have some fun here. Jack, while you're getting that wine ready, um, I've been asking what people are drinking. Um, we have, I think the Thank oldest you. is an 09 Chima, but we have some people drinking 2010 Sangios, um, lots of the recent stuff that we're tasting tonight, um, some 18 and 19 rosés, and we're already getting some questions for us to um, ask you guys later. Okay, fantastic. Man, well, talking about rosé in general, there's three different methods or really uh, ways of making uh, rosé. The <laughs> silliest, perhaps not silliest, but you're simply blending white wine with red wine. Uh, the other one is a method that we call saunye. Saunye um, uh, means in French to bleed, and that is simply um, I'd like to say that's kind of like making rosé as an afterthought. So you're actually bringing in, usually bringing in red wines or grapes to make into red wine. And after we crush them and uh, press it, I shouldn't say press it, but after we crush it, uh, we'll bleed off uh, a small percentage of the juice out of the fermenter. And so after it's colored up a little bit, and uh, make this uh, rosé out of that. The issue with that though is we're usually making a higher alcohol red wine with that juice. So therefore the alcohol content uh, in saunier's tend to be uh, on the high end anyway. The other way is to actually grow it. And uh, so um, in the past we have done some saunier's because we're primarily a, a red winery here. Um, but, you know, we really started enjoying the, the rosés that we were making, but sometimes, like I talk about that high alcohol aspect of it. And uh, one thing I love about rosés, a true rosé, is a lower alcohol. And uh, the way to get that is the third way of producing it, and that's to grow the uh, grapes specifically for Sangiovese. So we're heading, leaning that way. Um, Ed, you can jump in here and help me with this a little bit. But what we've done with our blocks of um, uh, Sangiovese out at Stillwater Creek, we've noticed that at the top of the vineyard, um, we have uh, more vigor at the top of the rows. So the, uh, the blocks there actually have a very beautiful south, uh, southern aspect to it. And all right, somebody's, uh, well, Looks like Romeo. All right. Um, <laughs> Yahoo. Um, thank you for sharing that with us. Uh, anyway, um, so the top of our rows have a, a bit more vigor in it and uh, tend to want to yield, have higher yields at the top, say the top 20 plants or so of those rows. And 
part of that is because they have a little more access to water up there uh, before uh, irrigation actually settles on down out and uh, becomes applied a little more evenly uh, down the rows. And uh, so what we'll do, we will take those plants up at the top, which have a little higher yield, and uh, harvest them for rosé. And when we harvest them for rosé, we're also harvesting them much earlier. So it does not, not have as much sugar content in it. Uh, this 2019, we actually harvested, it's a little higher than I wanted to, uh, but we harvested it at 22 bricks, which gave us an alcohol uh, of about 13.4%. One thing I love about rosés is enjoying them uh, for lunch. And I like lower alcohols, 12, 13% alcohols in the rosés, uh, just because you can have a glass of wine and it uh, doesn't hit you, doesn't hit you at all. You can still go back to work and enjoy things. But um, so, um, Ed, do you want to comment on that as far as uh, sure. growing, growing for rosé? Well, it's kind of interesting at the vineyard, um, we don't grow grapes out in the Frenchman Hills or anywhere in the Columbia Valley without the Grand Coulee Reservoir, because <laughs> we only get eight inches of rain a year. And if you're gonna dry farm, which I'm a true believer in dry farming, not dry farming, non-irrigation, when you can, but you need at least 23, 24 inches, which you don't get out here. Um, so our water comes in in a series of canal systems. and on the upper end of the vineyard where the canal runs along, we get a little seepage. And so the upper vines, the first couple of vines are a little more vigorous. And then after about 10, 15 vines, it moderates out into the areas that aren't affected by the seepage. So the vines are a little more vigorous and clusters get a little bit bigger and the berries get a little bit bigger and they take longer to ripen and they're usually not as good in a red wine. So they're absolutely perfect for a rosé. You get a little lighter varietal character, you get lighter color, and typically a little fruitier and lower alcohol by the when you pick. So it's a really good answer to an, an issue that we have in the vineyard <laughs> is to use <laughs> wines. The other thing is at the bottom end of all the rows, they'll be, end vines are always more vigorous because they don't have to compete with other vines for minerals and nutrients and water. And so what we do for Chuck on his rosés, we take those upper, upper row end vines that are more vigorous and then the lower row where you get all the water drains to after each irrigation and a couple of vines there. And we utilize those, so the old saying, you know, you you make rosé out of it. <laughs> so, <laughs> I won't say that. Yeah, it, yeah. Um, so in some in some years, we actually uh, before we were making the rosé, we actually wouldn't even harvest. I instruct Ed uh, to just hey, leave the top, you know, 10, 15, 20 plants or so, um, in the bottom three or four uh, plants, and so. Um, and when we talk about vigor, we're talking about uh, canopy growth. Uh, so the more vigor a plant, plant has or vine has, the more canopy growth you'll have. And as Ed said, you'll get bigger berries, um, higher yields. And so, um, and like you said, it takes longer to ripen. So we pick it early. And the earlier you pick grapes, uh, the more acid the grapes have in them. So. Uh, one of the things that makes rosé so refreshing is the amount of, of acidity that it has in there. So, um, and of course with rosé, we're not after color. So you can see this, for those of you that actually have this wine, has a real nice uh, light salmon pink color to it. So it's exactly what we're after. And so when we harvested this fruit, brought, brought it into the winery here, um, in the past, what we've done, we whole cluster pressed it. In other words, we just, with the grapes on the stems, put them into the press and squeeze the juice out of it and then put the uh, juice to tank. And we're finding that we wanted to get just a little bit more color than that. So this year, we actually ran the fruit through the distemmers, so knocking the berries off of the stems. 
and it also breaks the berries up a little, it will break some of the skins. And then we let it sit there on the skins for about two, three hours to get a tiny bit more color to it before putting those berries into the press. And then we press uh, the berries and take the juice. Mind you, nothing's fermented yet, and then we put it to tank. So we put it to steel tank, and then we lower the temperature. And we take it actually down to about 34 degrees, right around there, 34 to 36 degrees. And we let the wine settle, and this helps settle out a lot of the solids out of the wine. So it clears it up a bit, um, and um, then we'll rack the wine in order to take the wine off everything that's settled to the bottom, and uh, clean the tank out, return the wine to that tank, and we'll bring the temperature up. And once it gets to about 58, 60 degrees, we'll go ahead and inoculate it with yeast to begin the fermentation. And it's a slow fermentation. Uh, it took almost about a month for this to go completely dry. The style of rosé that we make is 100% dry. So the results of which are right in front of you. Hey, Abby, are there any questions I need to uh, address right now? There, I have a lot. Okay. Um, so what are your opinions on aged rosé? Ooh, yeah. For the most part, not a lot. <laughs> I love aged wines, and uh, but I have to admit, aged rosés are not uh, a thing that um, I'm personally fond of. But um, you know, it's that's just me. I it's uh, I just like a little cleaner, uh, more uh, refreshing rosé. And uh, when I say cleaner, more fruit in it, and uh, so so, but. That's just my personal, my personal opinion. So, but there's nothing wrong if you like aged rosés. Hey, have at it. You know, there's, it's very perfectly acceptable. So, um, I have a question for both of you. Um, so, Chuck, how do you favor Sangio versus some of the other wines we grow or we make? And then, Ed, how do you? put Sangio in terms of all the great varietals that you're growing at Stillwater Creek. <laughs> okay. Chuck or Ed first? Well, uh, I'll be happy to go first. Um, you know, we, I started out as a Bordeaux-centric wine, winery, I should say. Uh, in other words, just focusing on Bordeaux grapes. Uh, but the adventurer in me just wouldn't let me stay in that pigeonhole. So, uh, we ventured out into Syrah and Rhone varietals, um, and uh, then Mike Janik approached me and asked me, this before Ed joined the vineyard, uh, he said that he had some real, uh, thought he had a wonderful site there at Stillwater Creek, and um, he helped um, plan a lot of that vineyard, Mike Janik did. Anyway, mentioned uh, the Sangiovese, and uh, so I was all hyped on that because we since 1999, anyway, uh, we ventured into Sangiovese via San, uh, Seven Hills Vineyard. When Norm McKibben uh, called me and asked me if I wanted about a ton, ton and a half Sangiovese. And uh, so I'd never made it before. And when I first got it, crushed it. I didn't like it one bit. Uh, but it was the joy of discovery going through the motions I had no idea, never studied how to make Sangiovese, but just watching the process, watching the evolution of the fermentation and um, how the wine progressed, and it turned into something extremely beautiful and gorgeous. And so we started blending it with Bordeaux grapes, or Bordeaux varietals, I should say, and that was the birth of our Chima wine. So I absolutely love it. You know, uh, it's just the, it's just the, another flavor, you know, in our portfolio, and a whole nother personality, and uh, like I say, it likes you to hurry up and wait, and sometimes seduces you to try to pick early, and uh, so, uh, and there's so many different things you can do with Sangiovese, too, like I say, the rosé here, and uh, the blending, and 100% Sangio, so there's my thoughts on it, so as far as how compared to other grapes in our portfolio, you know, it's, a, it's another child. And uh, 
I love them all. And I learned something from all of them. And for that, I'm eternally grateful to the great. So, Mr. Ed? Well, um, I have at Stillwater Creek 51 planting blocks of about five acres. And I've got multiple clones of multiple varieties. And Sangiovese, it's, it's, makes it a more intellectual experience. <laughs> it's, a very, it's a very challenging variety to grow well for red wine. Um, as Chuck was saying, it's been around for at least a thousand years that we know of. And in Italy, there's well over 70 selections of it. Usually their genotypes are not true clones because it moved around so much they just have selections of everything. And it wasn't really until the last two decades that it was it gained notoriety as a as a lovely standalone varietal. And a lot of that was not due to the grape being the clones not being sophisticated. It was how we grew the grapes and how we made the wines. It's a challenge, like a Pinot Noir, it's a challenging grape to grow and it's a challenging wine to make. So I love growing it. It's, um, it's a larger clustered variety. It tends, except for maybe ones like Brunello, it tends to be very thin skinned, lighter clustered. And so the challenge is, and very heavy yielding. So the challenges to making a good, good wine out of it is to keep the yields low and to reduce the yields early so you don't overcrop the vine and to try to keep berries as small as possible to increase skin to volume. And so it's, it's a very challenging variety to grow. You have to be on top of your viticulture, um, speaking as a viticulturist not speaking for Chuck, but you have to be on top of the viticulture of it. And it is, it's just been the last couple of decades that we've really started making headway on how to make a great wine out of it. And by great wine, viticulture and enology. So the other things that I like about it is I found that if you treat it right with foliar minerals and, and drip applied, and minerals and soil science, the right kind of soil science, and which includes microbiology, soil ecology, that you can get the most out of it because it is thin skinned and our colors come from the skin. A lot of our, our flavor components, most of them come from the skin. And if you can thicken up that skin on those, and if you can get a little more organics into the soil, you'll increase the flavor components and the fruit components of it. So it's, it's kind of an intellectual variety to grow. You, you don't just go out there and prune it and water it and harvest it. It's, it requires attention. And yeah, go well, ahead. I, I was just gonna say with the thin skin aspect in addition to that, um, it makes it more susceptible to disease, but we do have a very, for the most part, dry uh, viticultural area here, which gives us a, a foot up in that aspect of it. But uh, if we get moisture out there, um, like we had a little bit this past year, and uh, so in the fall and ripening period, you have to be concerned about um, uh, molds developing in the clusters because the, the clusters, can't dry out in between the berries. Uh, uh, so in be that being more thin skin, it's more susceptible to be to microbial attack and mold attack out in the vineyards. So uh, That's very true, but that's also where viticulture comes in because there are certain minerals that I can add along the way, particularly at the onset of berry development that will thicken up and strengthen the skins. Uh, so for flavor, for disease, the Sangiovese is also susceptible to sunburn more than most varieties. So you have to play around with the canopies. You can't keep too much sunlight out, but you can't let too much sunlight in because they're a little more susceptible to heat stress. So it, 
it it is a challenging variety to grow and a lot of fun and challenging the other thing is is it's a big cluster and it has usually a single wing sitting on the side of the cluster it's kind of conical shaped cluster um on years when it gets a little iffy weather wise one of the things i do is i cut off clusters i mean the wings so i don't have clusters wings sitting on the clusters to help keep it from drying out and make it more susceptible to something like a botrytis rot so and also that gives a little bit better sunlight penetration so if we can reduce berry size even kind of initiate a little bit of berry shatter then we have a more open cluster for color and for rots and all that so fun variety to grow all and right Paul, yes ma'am uh, could ed elaborate a little bit more on what drip applied minerals are and like what type of minerals and yes sure. a little bit more you want ed to elaborate <laughs> <laughs> oh boy, we're going to be here all week. <laughs> by, no, by drip applied minerals, we I add minerals in through the irrigation system. So I will at where I pull the water out of the reservoir and pump it in, I inject in certain minerals. And I, I tend to use minerals like humates, very soft minerals, calciums. Um, humates are really good for microbial development in the soil you derive a lot of micronutrients and nitrogen from them so and then phosphorus and everything else we need as we take things out of the soil over time we need to put things back which is the basis of sustainable agriculture and then by foliar minerals i'll add that in along with it i apply minerals through my my spray machines so if i put on sulfur dust for mildew control i will add calcium potassium and interestingly enough with sangiovese it tends to not always have good color you can add sea kelp in and sea kelp is known to incre increase color pigmentation in wine grapes so those are a couple of the reasons we can do potassium and calcium through the drip and through the foliars will Will create a stronger, thicker, healthier cell wall. So, as well as increase photosynthesis. So, <laughs> for those of you who I'll cut it short there, <laughs> talk talk about the, the drip. Uh, there's literally a hose that goes down the trellis system about a foot off the ground, and it has emitters placed along that. So uh, it drips exactly where Ed wants those uh, emitters to drip. Uh, water uh, right around the rooting zone of each individual plant. So that's right. we, so we it's have not a big sprinkler system yeah. or anything like that. I always assume people know about drip irrigation. <laughs> My apologies, but we are emit. We have two emitters per plant. The the drip line runs down the row and is held about 18 inches off the ground. And on the hills, I have a drip emitter above and below the plant. They're basically a half gallon per hour emitters. And the way I irrigate after I get out all the soil moisture from the winter is I give the vines what they need each week based on evapotranspiration. What is the vine using? So I don't irrigate real deep, in particular in San Giovese, I like to hold the vigor down and just to keep those clusters a little under control, sizes. Ed, do, um, do you know if Italian Sangio growers apply minerals like this through drip irrigation, or is that more a unique, like, U.S. viticulture technique? I, it varies. Modern viticulture in Italy, as well as everywhere, uses drip irrigation. Um, where you can, people will always dry farm, non-irrigate. And so many, many places are still non-irrigated in Italy and when I got out of college I went and farmed myself out to some multi-generational Italian farmers because I wanted to learn the real farming of it and these guys these guys farm they farm from the heart it's it's a spiritual thing they um I got scars on my back from when I made bad pruning cuts when they were teaching me they would beat me 
if I did it right, they gave me wine at break time. So yeah, they're still the old Italian systems I love. And in California, in many places, even back in the 2000s, I was planting to the old style of Italian head train spur prune where they look like a little goblet and non-irrigating where I could and no wires in the vineyard and it was just ancient and beautiful. So yes, they do use more modern techniques of drip irrigation and fertigation. Um, so, but in addition to those, I also broadcast minerals to the whole soil surface in the, in the fall because we're trying to feed the whole soil to feed the plants. So there's really in the vineyard three types of fertilization we do, which is to amend the soils to drip, run fertigation, run minerals through the drip and to apply them foliarly. That way we can more create fine wines. Good deal. All right, oh, I'm sorry. Jack, if that's okay. Yeah, sure, go ahead. Okay. Um, a lot of the questions are more specific to Sandria Base Red, so I'm going to save those until later when we're tasting and talking about Perfect. that. Um, but is thicker skin better for quality fruit? Just in general. In general, yeah, thicker skin that will, we touched on uh, disease a little bit ago, but uh, the flavors, the color, uh, the tannins, all those are derived from the skins. Uh, some of the tannins are derived from uh, seeds and uh, stems and, and oak also, but uh, the majority of the flavor and color, all that is uh, derived from the skin. So the thicker the skin, the more of those uh, phenolic compounds, as we call them, you'll get in the wine. And so, and berry size also has a lot to do with it too. Ed mentioned the volume to uh, skin ratio. So the smaller the berries, the more skin to juice ratio you're going to have in that berry. So that means there's more skin to that loop, that bit of juice uh, where we can extract color and tannin and the flavors from it. So yes, generally speaking, and they will generally speaking uh, lead to wines that age longer too just because there are more of those compounds or this phenolic that can be extracted from the grape. And just to touch on that, just uh, the berry size is very important. Yes, thick skins are good and for disease control, for flavors and everything, but the berry size is something that we work very, well, I work very hard in the vineyard to try to control. And we have a few physiological times within the vineyard that we can control berry size. So it's, it's, it's kind of interesting. Somebody wants me to touch on that, I can, but I don't know what everybody wants to hear right now. <laughs> um, but it, but it's interesting. Yeah, I, I would actually like you. Go, go ahead. I think it'd be really interesting so, to make it kind of quick. I'll make it very quick. Right after bloom, we, the berries and after set, the berries will start to size. When you get about two weeks after bloom and set, just before pea-sized berries, there's physiologically a point in time called rapid cell division. So the real, total- real, real, real quickly, Ed, bloom, you wanna tell them what bloom and set are real quick? Well, bloom is when, bloom is when the, the clusters flower and they pollinate and they set the grapes. Set is the number of berries left on the cluster after bloom. And that's dependent on how well they pollinated and became fruitful. If the berries aren't fruitful, they will hopefully and typically fall off the cluster. That's called shatter. So set is what you have left on berries on the cluster after they've shattered, which is dependent upon pollination, the percentage of pollination. So. It's right after the berries start to size up. Let's just say you have slightly less than pea-sized berries. There's a rapid cell division going on within the berry. They don't increase in size, just the total number of cells. So if we reduce the amount of water, kind of hold back and stress them a little bit, not a lot, but a little bit, 
you can reduce the total number of cells within the grape, therefore affect the total berry size for the end of the year. How's that? And I, as a wine grower, love small berries, or <laughs> winemaker, I should say. I, as a grape so, grower, like to produce them. Yes. But yeah. nature's pretty tricky. She doesn't always let me. <laughs> I have two more questions, if that's OK, before we get back to our tasting. The one is for Ed. Ed, when you worked with other wineries uh, before you were like fully employed down in California and in Washington for them, did you by chance do Wolf or Willing Workers on Organic Farms? Did I do what now? It's called Wolf. It's a, a program. Um, it stands for Willing Workers on Organic Farms, and you can travel all around the world, and you could like do almost like an internship or something and stay at a winery and help them harvest or you could go to Italy and you um, grow harvesting. And I, I did not do work with them but when myself and about four others really got sustainable and organics going in the California vineyards in Napa and Sonoma and that was back in the early 80s and that was before that existed but what we did have is because we were smart enough to know it's not all about grapes we travel up and down the Pacific Northwest and talk to all kinds of growers because we were trying to define what is organic agriculture because we, we didn't have all the rules back in. So it's really like we had, during the chemical revolution, had lost our, our forefathers that we all were supposed to learn from. <laughs> so we had to make up our own rules and find our pathways through there. So no, they didn't have that program back then that I know of. But so we we were a family of organic growers. So we there's lots of organic groups around and sustainable groups. I still like the word sustainable the most of all, but um but we did have a lot of people come and stay with us and work with us. And we brought soil scientists that we liked what they were doing that varied from what the universities were doing. We brought them out and put on seminars, um, you know, to learn more organic approaches. So it, and we worked with people in New Zealand and Italy and South Africa. That was, that's the fun of it. So yeah, indirectly, directly, no, indirectly kind of, yeah. Cool. Cool. Um, so going back to uh, rosé, um, how long were skins left on this year's rosé? About two hours is what how, how long the juice stayed on the skin. So not very long at all. So, so yeah. All right. Well, we'll get back to the tasting just a little bit here. But uh, Anyway, uh, we actually harvested the Sangiovese on uh, September 27th at 22 bricks. And uh, bricks is a measure of sugar content in the grape. And so the longer we leave it on the vine, typically the higher the brick or sugar content will uh, become in the grape. So um, again, this equated to about a 13.4% alcohol in the wine. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, I like them a little bit lower, but um, uh, we, anyway, it, it, it is what it is. So uh, I can't remember the exact circumstances, but I was probably about a day too late in uh, picking this, a day or two too late, because uh, I would have liked to have actually had them uh, picked it probably more around 20, uh, 19 or 20 bricks, but, um, but I'm really, really, uh, I love the results of this though, overall. So uh, the aromatics, um, you know, one thing that really stands out to me is uh, a fresh, uh, we have strawberries in our, in our yard. And so the early uh, season strawberries and sometimes you get the little, what we call, I don't know, white heads on top of the strawberries and stuff. I get a lot of that in the nose and, uh, and uh, guava going on in there so um 
Well, so in the nose, one thing that really stood out to me in this wine too, in the palate, I really um, get a lot of kiwi going in this. So I get a little bit of strawberry and kiwi. And in the, at the finish, I get uh, like a, uh, a light squeeze of uh, ruby grapefruit going on in there. But uh, oh no, I find, I find it is a really pleasing um, uh, rosé with you know, a nice uh, refreshing acidity to it. It's not over the top acid going on on there, but uh, uh, I call it medium plus amount of acid. And, uh, and I think it just has a real nice uh, pleasing mouthfeel to it too. So sometimes you get a lot of acid in there where what we call just peeling the enamel off your teeth. And I've had plenty of rosés that seem that way. Sometimes there's just so much acid. And uh, so I'm, I'm really happy with the overall balance of, of this wine and how it's, how it's turned out. So for all of those of you that actually have this wine, um, I hope you can see some of uh, what I'm tasting in there. Uh, are there other observations uh, that, that you have, those of you who are tasting the wines? Well, we're waiting for those questions. I have one thing to add in this, is you said that Sangiovese is such a trippy wine to grow and make. Um, you said you may have been a day late on that. One of the things, that we had to learn with Sangiovese more than a lot of other varieties, and they're all important this way, but what makes the wine good is the, the, the winemaker has to be out tasting. Sometimes the numbers are a lot less important on this variety than the actual flavors of the grapes. And Chuck is one I know because I sell a number of wineries that gets out there more than anyone and tastes. And he'll come up, well, Ed, you know, I'd like to pick this, but I think I better wait a couple of days. And he'll talk to me for quite a while on why and the flavor components. That wasn't an insult. Um, I like the information. So it really is one of those that doesn't run by numbers. You know, I, I would say on San Gervais, I give 25% of my weight to the numbers and 75% to the flavors for harvest maturity. Absolutely, and, and uh, numbers are just a guideline, and they, they confirm what I taste out there in in the wine or in the vineyard itself. Um, but uh, hey, you know, sometimes, like say, the style of wine I was trying to make, though, I would have loved to just see a little bit lower alcohol. But I don't recall exactly what I was thinking at that point in time, but. Uh, that maybe we just couldn't make it happen. <laughs> I don't know, but uh, anyway. I think um, your truck broke down. <laughs> yeah, it did happen one time. Yeah, I remember that. First day of harvest, you, I don't know, that was what, three or four years ago, wasn't it? And I had to call you out there and you came and rescued me on uh, Highway 26 there, just west yeah, of Othello. He needed a cup of coffee. Yeah, I needed a cup of coffee. Interesting <laughs> thing, though, while I was there waiting for the tow truck, um, I was there was a guardrail there, and I was waiting for Ed, and uh, I'm looking at the backside of the guardrail, and I see something stuck between the guardrail and the, uh, the uh, oh, I don't know, the, the piece of wood there holding it in the ground, and stuffed in there, it turned out to be a geocache. <laughs> so... Anyway, do you folks know what a geocache is? Hey, people will, there's a game where um, people will go stash a little something and give the coordinates. And so then they have to take, people have to take their, uh, or give hints to where it is. And you're online and uh, you just you go out there and you hunt down this little prize, whatever it is. So I put it back <laughs> there for whoever was looking for it. So, but anyway. So there you go. All right, Abby, anything else on the rosé here? People have been commenting about what they're tasting too for those also drinking rosé and we're getting- and what do we have? Grapefruit and rhubarb. i uh, got that one a few times. Definitely agreeing with you with the strawberries and cantaloupe. Um, and then a couple people are um, drinking the 2018 rosé. Um, mm -hmm. Do you say that's comparable? 
Because that was also a 100% Sangio, so Water Creek Rosette. Yeah, no, the 2018 was very beautiful. I actually had a bottle of it uh, the other night, and yeah, I, I do think it's comparable. If I recall, it's a little lower alcohol than this guy is. But uh, yeah, yeah, very. Um, I think this one, um, his, um, gosh, how, how can I say it? Um, a tiny bit more elegant, I think, than the 18. Not a lot. But just a little bit. Well, eight, so. yeah, eighteen was a lot hotter, leading up to harvest. A yeah. lot, lot, lot hotter year. Two nineteen, we had a lot of rain, all through August and September. Yeah, and I was going to say it's almost like there's a little more tannin, if you will, in the two thousand eighteen, and I think that's one of the things that made it a little less um, elegant, if you will. So. Yes, uh, white wines and roses. But maybe do that 2018 will age a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There, there you go. There you go. So, Chuck, you were mentioning about the alcohol, and someone had actually asked a question if Stillwater Creek Sangio typically is higher alcohol than most Italian Sangios. No, not at all. Um, I was actually really blown away last summer, actually, just about almost a year ago, 11 months ago, Tracy and I. Uh, we went to Chianti Classico and uh, so got the opportunity uh, to taste their wines, but I was really blown away by the alcohol levels um, of their wines. They're now, I don't think I saw a single red uh, Sangio under 14%. Most were 14.3 to 14.7, even 14.8. So, uh, it's, we're seeing higher alcohols. I, I think that's winemakers stylistically have gone that way with time. Um, and there's also been issues in, again, Ed can talk more to this too, but um, with warmer temperatures and sugars ripening out of sync, if you will, with the uh, phenolic ripening. So we get higher sugar levels before the phenolics ripen up. So we have to wait for the phenolics, which are those flavor components and uh, to ripen and to, to, to develop. So consequently, we have wines with higher sugar content and higher alcohols. That's what we've seen over steadily happening over the last uh, 20 years. Anyway. So Ed, do you have anything you want to add to that? You know, it's, it's it's so year to year. Again, it comes down to flavor um, and management and crop loads. And Sangiovese, again, is one that you really have to manage your crop load to get your flavor components. When you refer to, it's been referred to, Sangioveses can be very rustic in flavor, which is saying yuck. Um, it's usually they've left too much fruit on the vine. And it just, it just, it doesn't get good varietal maturity. You don't get the fruit flavors. You don't have the acid balances to fruit and you get more of the, the more minerally leathery kind of stuff because it just doesn't ripen to varietal maturity. So it's so hard to really get the, the crop loads correct because it's, it's such a large cluster. And to give you an idea, on, with the same sized vines. Our rows are eight feet wide and five feet between vines. On a Cabernet, I might leave 28 clusters to get up to three and a half tons an acre. On a Sangiovese, I'll leave 13, 14 clusters, just to give you a size difference. And that might include cutting off wings. So it, really until the last couple decades when they learned that we have to keep because Sangiovese not if you don't adjust the crop will put out eight nine tons an acre and we yeah. we try to set our target yields at around three and a half tons an acre for quality so it i can't really add a whole lot to the alcohol <laughs> part of it it's just it's year to year it's it's just highly variable as the weather. You know, last year, 219, we had a lot of rain. So it kept the grapes plumped up more. So they were actually more rain dilute, so to speak. And 
hot, dry falls, the grapes will be more dehydrated, so the sugars will concentrate more. So it's not just photosynthesis, it's, it's just physical, physiological factors. Um, Absolutely. Oh, I'm sorry, go, go ahead, Abby. Ed was um, talking about the vineyards. I was gonna just screen share a couple photos of our vineyard rows so people could see it. But um, as we move into the Sangiovese red wine, um, we had a couple people asking, um, how did the fires impact the vintage and if we saw any smoke damage up in um, Stillwater Creek? No, we've never had smoke damage, at least since I've been here. We've had a lot of smoky years, but the smoke has been high atmosphere smoke. The, this picture is just taken, well, that, this picture right here, this is a Sangiovese clone. I believe that's 23. That was just taken about four days ago. So we're right at bud break. Yeah, you, I was gonna say, you can just barely see the leaves starting to appear there on the cordons. On the These are just a couple photos from around the vineyard to show you what our vineyard looks like. If, can you go back one photo? Just to locate, right in if you look across the way the the mountains that's the saddle mountains and the wallug slopes on the other side that little saddle you see there almost right there where the pointer is is where the columbia river cuts through the saddle mountains so we're we're just north of the wallug slope by about 10 miles yet we're about 300 heat degree units less than the wallug slope we are kind of like a North Rhone. We're about 2,000, 3,000 heat units, where the Wallach Slope is maybe, we're kind of upper two, right at region three. The Wallach Slope is a little higher than that in mid threes. And then, for example, Red Mountain will be about 3,600 heat units. And that's just a measurement of yearly heat. This is obviously not bud break, but this just show you kind of what the, that's Mount Rainier from the vineyard. More yeah. shots of the vineyard. Hey, Abby. Oh, there you go. You zoomed in there a little bit on the bud break. You can see a little bit more. There you go. Ed did share with us some great um, macro lens photos, I believe. Oh, that, that's that's my vineyard assistant. Okay, this is this is this year San Giovese. Um, this is just past bud break. I call bud break when the leaves begin to unfurl. The actual bud break begins quite a bit earlier than that. This is just bud break's beautiful. I mean, look at this. People, you don't look that close at bud break, but it's actually yeah, the, quite beautiful. The colors in the bud, the texture. You can actually it's see gorgeous. some fruit primordia in that picture right there. The fruit that we have in 2020 was formed in the buds in June, in July and August of 2019. Just for little tidbits, trivia. <laughs> so how we're growing yeah. in any in a year affects how we grow in every year. So yes. we're, I'm always thinking about next year and three more years in every year that I'm growing. Abby, is there, do we have a picture of uh, the EVA map of Washington State? Stillwater Creek is a little further north than most of the vineyards and is higher in altitude than many of them. And that I think is one of the beauties of Stillwater Creek Vineyard because we get plenty of warmth during the day, but we cool off into the fifties typically at night. And so I think that's one of the reasons Stillwater Creek has good color and all their fruit is it doesn't get too intensely hot. Excessive heat, can hurt the skins of the grapes and cut back on color pigmentation. 
So Abby, can you take your cursor there and you show the Saddleback Mountains on the south side, which is, yeah, those are Saddleback yes, Mountains right there. And then the Frenchman Hills, which make the north side of the Royal Slope. So everything in between those two east running. Uh, they both trend east and west. Yes, and that's the, that's the Royal Slope. Now, Ed and I, we had a real interesting conversation last year, and we were talking about why is it that while, I mean, that Royal Slope uh, is, is, is cooler than the Waluk Slope. And uh, Ed pointed out that Snoqualmie Pass to the, is directly east of the Royal Slope, and it's a low point in the Cascades. So it allows for that cooler air to break the cascade dam, if you will. And uh, just when the wind is happening, anyway, moving, but anyway, allows for cooler air anyway to come down from Snoqualmie Pass. And the Royal Slope and Stillwater Creek Vineyard is right in line with that. And uh, it makes complete, complete sense to me anyway. Uh, that uh, it, it, it was just something I th a theory on my part but I mean if you're ever up in Ellensburg it's windy and cooler than anywhere else around the wind just hums through there and as it comes down across that vantage bridge I think what makes our vineyards so nice in a way even on the Frenchman Hills we're 15 miles or so along the Frenchman Hills that the wind kind of diminishes by the time you get there so we get more warmth and less wind than you would if you were right along the Columbia River on the Frenchman Hills. But it also, I think that the Saddle Mountains tend to kind of channel that wind away from the Waluk Slope. So it's, I really like the slightly cooler aspect of, so again, we're kind of equivalent to the North Rhone area as far as heat units go. And for me as a winemaker, I really appreciate it, particularly for the varieties that we do get from Stillwater Creek. Uh, it's great for the Chardonnay. Uh, it's fantastic for, uh, I think, the Sangiovese uh, with the just slightly cooler temperatures. Uh, it, we get a little bit more hang time out of it and uh, better acid balance in the fruit too. The Merlot, um, I no longer get any Merlot from uh, the Wild Oak Slope. It was great in cool vintages, but in the warmer vintages, uh, we we're finding that uh, we we're losing a lot of acid in the in the Merlot, and the fruit wasn't as balanced as we'd like to see. Um, we don't find that at all with uh, Stillwater Creek. We get perfect balance. Uh, out of that vineyard, and thanks to Ed's fantastic skills as a viticulturist. <laughs> <laughs> so it's great for these varieties. So uh, just refresh: we we get uh, Chardonnay, Viognier, Merlot, and uh, Sangiovese from Stillwater Creek. So and occasionally we get a tiny bit of uh, uh, Sauvignon Blanc too. So but very little of that maybe a half a ton or something, so. All right, are there any more questions along those lines before we move into uh, the 2018 Sangiovese? Um, if it's okay with everybody, I'm gonna hold off just so we can taste the uh, next wine, um, and then I'll ask the next round of questions. All right. I just got this sent in the mail to me overnight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Here, here you are. Here's a here's a picture of our wonderful 2018 Felix Sangiovese. Cheers, Ed. Cheers. <laughs> and now we're we'll use elbows. Yeah, <laughs> there you are. See the new the new the new way we have to go. Cheers now in the vineyard industry. Tap elbows and then drink. There, there you go. Mmm. Yeah. All right. Um, so. Boy, so we, we have, you know, what's nice about it, we do have good color in this Sangiovese. Um, we harvested this, um, uh, gosh, when did we harvest this? 
Well, I'm going to have to pass on that one. I think I left that inside the other in my office. But um, uh, like I say, San Giovese, when it comes to harvesting for the red, um, it seems like there's a big opening uh, flavor profile wise when I can choose to harvest it, just depending on the style of San Giovese that, uh, that we want to make. Uh, Ed was mentioning uh, yields, how important the yields are. And we've experienced that. We've played around with yields in this vineyard. Anywhere from, oh, we've gotten anywhere from about two and three quarter tons all the way up to um, a little over four and a half tons. And uh, I've learned my lessons. <laughs> and uh, we can certainly certainly see see a difference with it. So, um, but uh, what um, I'm getting in the wine though, I get this really beautiful um, kind of ex exotic notes out of it. And uh, a little beautiful, what I, I can only think of uh, a little potpourri going on in this. So some nice floral notes there. Um, Get a little bit of dark raspberry happening, and plum, and um, maybe even a little uh, sun-dried tomato, and uh, little hints of herb going on in there too. So, which it's, oh, uh, it, it's fun. The, the other thing that I get with it too that I absolutely love in wine um, is uh, carpaccio. <laughs> you know, just there's a tiny bit of fleshiness in there that I, I really, really enjoy. So. Um, so what stands out to me, this is 100% Sangiovese. What's standing out to me, um, in some respects, there's almost a little Bordeaux aspect to this. And that's, to me, is a sign of just excellent uh, Sangiovese. Um, we have good extraction from this. Got some nice uh, sour black cherry going on. I kind of really get that sour cherry a little bit in the nose too. A um, little bit of uh, current kind of I kind of lean more towards red currant, but there might even be a little bit of black currant uh, happening in there. And um, I don't know. I, did. I used to get it, uh, more mineral out of this, but it seems like as it's aging, the mineral aspect is diminishing in it. Um, so, um, but uh, and it has real nice. I think it has nice soft, fine palette uh, tannin structure to it and the acidity in it I think is delightful. Um, it's it's not over the top uh, acidity that Sangiovese uh, can have sometimes and so um, I just find this is a is a real beautiful pleasing Sangiovese and um, I really expressing these two clones I think really beautifully. The clone um, 19, in my experience uh, with Stillwater Creek clone 19, it will exhibit uh, a little bit more uh, of the fruit, uh, a little more fruit forward to it. And the clone 23, I find um, sometimes we'll have a little bit more color, but we'll get a little bit more tannin structure on it. So by mirroring the two uh, clones together, blending them together, um, we find it absolutely wonderful. Um, this, we actually vinified both these clones separately and then blended them. Uh, probably, oh, I don't know, about uh, oh, four or five months anyway, after, after uh, harvest, after being put to barrel. Um, the reason why I do that um, is because I want to learn how each clone uh, manifests itself. So if I blend these things together earlier, um, I'm not going to learn much from them. So over the years, I've, I've been blending them together earlier and earlier. In fact, uh, 2019, we actually uh, uh, co-fermented the fruit. So, um, so yeah. So, yes, ma'am.
Can you elaborate more on the difference between phone 19 and 23 and how, um, what they do to the Sangiovese when they're combined? You mean what we get when we marry them or do you want a little more definition of them separately? Both. <laughs> Both. <laughs> well, um, like I say, I, I tend to think, um, you know, it's interesting, berry-wise, as far as the size of it, um, you know, I, I used to think that they were about equal size, but some years um, I've seen the uh, 19 a little bit smaller than uh, 23, and I've seen it opposite, too. Um, so my thoughts on that, I don't know. Ed, do you have any thoughts on berry size between the two? I think they're... They're pretty comparable. <laughs> I think 23 may be a, a tad bit smaller, clustered, and buried. Um, but, you know, it's when you get into clones on these things, it's also interesting because, like I said, these all came from Italy. And from Italy, they were, they were not true clones. They were geno they were, they were basically selections of fruit. But then when Foundation Plant Service took over, they took a selection from what they thought were certain clones. They took a single cutting from a single vine, so all the now the, all the propagants are clonal. So it's clonal, non-clonal kind of thing. So they're they're very similar. Um, clone 19 really. Oh, when did it come in? It came in in 1995. And that was brought into Robert Mondavi's vineyard. Uh, I don't remember the fellow's name. And in 96, 23 came in to the Robert Pepe sites, but they don't know what clone it was. So they propagated from one plant off of, they call it the, the Bob Jr. clone, so to speak. But so these are all, if you went back to Italy and tried to, you'd need DNA samples to know if they were really very different. So they're very close, in other words. And like I said, Italy has over well over 70 clones. We've been playing around with them. And I can tell you that clonal material, not, no matter what variety it is, is has interesting history. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's funny because 70 is the number that I generally hear panted about, but I also read sometimes that, I mean, there's just so many variations that they could exactly. even say there's maybe like over a thousand different, you know, quote unquote. Right. Or they could all be very, way less than that. They just grow different in different places with different soils, with different man management. And, you know, the genotyping of them is what they're going on in, for so long in Italy. But, you know, it's just, it's hard to say. But anyway, the, I would say that clone 23 is probably slightly s smaller clustered and smaller buried. Yeah. Maybe a little, little more intense fruit in it. Well, but, I tend to get, um, it seems like it, 23 will hide its fruit a little bit more though too. Yeah, that and, would be uh, the higher has, tannins. Yeah, it has a higher tannin structure to it. Sometimes I think shows exhibits a little bit more color. So, um, but I get brighter fruit out of the uh, uh, clone 19. And um, so when, when they marry, you get those different aspects together where you get the brighter fruit and the, the darker, a little more intense fruit and the tannins. Um, so the 19 helps mellow out the 13 or 23 a little bit. So it makes a really wonderful uh, partnership, if you will, uh, with these two clones. So I've, I've been very, very happy uh, with both of them. In fact, every time that we've put them to, you know, assess them separately, um, we, we never like them as much as when we uh, marry them. So. The, the other thing to remember about Sangiovese is that as the vines mature, probably, well, maybe Zinfandel's right along the same kind of footing is this, as the vines mature, the fruit characteristics will change. You'll go from more of a cherry to a ripe cherry, from kiwis to figs and things like that as they get more and more mature. Plus, 
you know, it's learning how to grow these grapes is an evolutionary process. So as I learn more about them, I play more with the viticulture of it from just the physical, how do I manage the canopies and the crop loads to the minerals? And, you know, I try to talk with Chuck every year and I try to play with the vines every year. And that's what this whole process is about, winemaking and viticulture. We keep trying to evolve better better wines out of it all. Yep, and uh, Ed's a great psychiatrist also. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what percentage of each clone was in the 18? Uh, these are uh, just about 50 50. It's, uh, I looked that up earlier today just to verify, and we're like a uh, difference of like one and a half, one, a little over 1% anyway. So they're, they're super close. <clears throat> Um, and then another technical question about the 2018 vintage. Um, how long did we ferment it with the skins and barrel age it? Oh boy, no, it's, gosh, I looked it up for the uh, rosé, the, um, the San Giovese, I would, if I recall, it was it was on the skins. We fermented it and we pressed it off a tiny bit early, but um, I want to say it was about eleven days anyway on skins. So, so it wasn't too bad. And so. then, how long did we age it in barrels? And what oh, uh, I can that thing. I have to look up. I have it right here. Um, let's see here. It was, that would have been in barrel, um, oh, about 15 months anyway in barrel. So, so there you go. Little, little over a year, about a year and a quarter, anyway, in, in barrel. Um, so we actually, we have someone who's um, watching this video who helped us with the 2018 Harvest Vintage, and that's Keith. And he made the comment that punch downs for Sangio were always really hard in particular because of those thick skins. <laughs> there you go. Hey, Keith, welcome to the show. So for those of you, um, we've been talking about Novelty Hill. So Keith worked Harvest here for us for three years. And oh, now he's running away. All right. <laughs> How you doing, Keith? Doing pretty well, Chuck. How are you? I'm doing great. So uh, we talked about Mike Janik. And uh, Keith is uh, from Bellevue area and went to school at Whitman. And that's how we got to know him there. And his, uh, Parents are also very good uh, friends of mine now. And, uh, but Keith has been working, what, this is your second year at uh, Janik Novelty Hill? Yeah, I, I actually just celebrated a year, a year there. <clears throat> All right, congratulations. Yeah, it's been a lot of fun. Thank you. So you still have those guns from punching down the San Giovese? <laughs> <laughs> But that three day, that three workout a day regimen is a tough one to follow outside yeah. of harvest season. Uh, Keith is quite the animal. He had no no problem doing it though. So, well, I so Keith has been involved with a lot of bottling, from what I understand here lately. So, so Keith, have you had the opportunity to meet Ed yet? I have not actually, but I've heard many great things about him through Mike. Well, yeah. one yeah. of these days, if we're ever allowed to visit wineries and things. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I would love to love to sit down and talk with you. Um, Mike always has so much, so many great things to say about like your judgment and about like when to pick versus not. Um, you are very articulate and very obviously very well established with what you do. So Mike is always very thankful to be working with you. Well, that's nice to hear. Boy, thank him for that. And uh, I think we all are. <laughs> so, well, fantastic. Well, thanks for joining us, Keith. I really, really appreciate it. It means a lot that you hopped in and uh, 
uh, taking part in all of this. So, gosh. So, Happy to be here. All right. Well, gosh. Hey, Ed, have you, you know, minerals are an interesting thing. You know, people talk about tasting minerals in wine. Um, you know, can, would you tell us a little bit about one, the soil structure there at uh, Seven Hills and- um, I can't talk the, about Seven Hills. Seven Hills, God. <laughs> <laughs> I'm fixated. Well, there- Can't you let there, you off that easy. There, there, there goes my uh, harvest, my 2020 <laughs> harvest at Stillwater Creek. It have was a, nice have working have with you. <laughs> have another drink of the red wine there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you think I would uh, didn't have a dump bucket here or something? Uh, it's definitely uh, yeah, old age setting in here. So, um, but anyway, so if we can talk about the soil structures there at uh, and what the soils are made up of, there's Stillwater Creek, and then also I'd like to get your thoughts just on uh, what you think minerality and wine in general. You know, there's always a discussion: is it real? Can you tell the difference between? Uh, slate and basalt and loam and uh, uh, that that sort of thing. I have my thoughts on it, but I sure love to, to hear yours. <laughs> I should ask you to go first, but oh. um, no, no. Um, I'd be glad to. Yeah. I think the most important part of the soil, there, there is no one mineral that leads to wine quality, but the better the structure of the soil, always the better the wine quality and the health of the vine. Um, the balances of minerals within the soil pretty much lead to soil structure. So the ratios be calcium, magnesium, the amount of potassium in the soil, these are all very important but they're, they're mostly important to the soil structure. And I think a lot of what people say minerality depends on if you're in Washington, it's, we're very sandy soils. They have a very low cation exchange capacity, which is the ability of the soil to hold minerals and water. Um, that's usually in the clay and the loam and the organic matter. It's also, our soils tend to be, not Walla Walla, I'm talking about the desert, tend to be low in organic matter. And what I found over time, organic matter has a lot of influence on the fruit characteristics. So the yin yang of it, you know, minerality versus fruit, what's more abundant? The higher the organic matter, I'd find the higher the, the fruit characters. The lower the organic matter, the more the mineral nature comes out. So in Washington in general and in Stillwater Creek, I always say Stillwater Creek because of the Missoula floods, you know, we were, were basically fractured basalt with 14,000 years of wind alterations, <laughs> you know, blowing, blowing sand and a little bit of silt up in there. So we have very, very good micronutrient structure, trace elements, we're typically low in organic matter because we're a desert. We don't get much rain. We don't have much plant growth. And that's one of the things I've been playing with over time is how do I build and improve the soils without changing what makes Washington so great? I don't want to get rid of that minerality. yet. I want to enhance the soils and increase the abilities to hold minerals and and actually increase the fruit at the same time. So I'd say sandier soils, very good mineral structure, micronutrients, trace elements, um, organic matter low. Um, so, and the cation exchange capacity is low, meaning very little clay, very little organic matter. So we require more irrigation, more fertilizations because we have less ability, a smaller bank for holding minerals. So we need to, we need to put it in more often, which is kind of a fun thing because then I can more manage what's going on within the plant. But the beauty of Stillwater Creek and a lot of the Columbia Basin is it's got tremendous soil structure, which really I think is one of the things that makes Washington really a great area to grow grapes. 
I mean, I think what makes maybe Walla Walla a little different is you're into more clay structure out there, a little richer soils in many ways. And so you get a different set of fruit characters out there, which is a really, I think, good way to, you know, the desert plus Walla Walla, mix the fruit, mix everything up. But yeah, I find, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. I was just gonna say, great soil structure, great, great mineral structure. Um, it's really good for grapes. Yeah, and I find the tannin structure also uh, is a little different than too between the more organics in the soil versus uh, more mineral um, sandier content. I find that the, the with when you get into more clay, you, the t tannins tend to be rounder, sometimes bigger. I find when we get right. over into the more sandier soils, we get finer tannins. Um, and I, I think of it as different textures. I often think of uh, the uh, more organic content is rounder, more like burlap sack type uh, uh, yeah. woven. The more the more clay and organic matter, it's a little more voluptuous. Yeah, it, exactly. And then then I also then with a sandier soil, I think the tannin structure is more like a fine coping saw or something, really tiny, it's fine teeth and. Uh, right. So. Well, remember minerals are typically held in your organic matter and your colloidal clay. So you'll have more of an abundance in a higher of minerals in a higher loam soil. And again, I think the minerality stands out a little bit more when you get into the desert soils because of the lat the yin yang of it, you have fewer, fewer of the fewer well, of the organic matter. And it's really interesting too, when you look at uh, the flood deposited soils too. Uh, the loams that we have around here, um, you, you know, people think of the basalt and then with that on top, but when you really look at those uh, flood deposits, really what we see in there, we, we don't see basalt content. We see quartzite, we see feldspar. If you think of it, it is uh, broken down, a lot of it's broken down granite from, uh, southern BC and uh, Alberta and Montana and, uh, and Idaho. And right, so we have lo very little of that out in the desert. I mean, in fact, all those deposits went down and that's a lot of what your Willamette, Willamette Valley is. Mm -hmm. I actually broke through the Cascades, but now it, the soils have a tremendous influence on grapes. In California, where I worked for 30 years, I could taste somebody's wine and tell them quite often what was going on in their soil <laughs> without looking because you just get this correlation you get to drink them so many times taste them i could tell her hey you're low in organic matter or you know blah 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 blah, blah. it's it's kind of fun that way or i could tell people you got a lot of clay in there because your soils aren't breathing you got terrible soil structure you can taste that after a while but i say in general the soil structure in Washington is tremendous. And I think along with the climates, you just got so much solar radiation because you're not being influenced so much by the ocean, Bordeaux, California, places. You just got lots of solar radiation out here and lots of long, beautiful days. And I think the soils plus the climate, cool nights in a lot of places, it's Washington's gonna make more great vintages than most places in the world. Um, here, more here. consistencies in, in in the mountains that mitigate that climate for us and uh, yeah. uh, created uh, you know I like calling the Cascades a great squeegee you know and uh, it's really responsible for a lot of the climate and just in the climate there at uh, at Stillwater Creek with Snoqualmie Pass that little unique feature there and uh, what it does so um, that that's the fun thing about it. I I say all the time. I, I wish I had all the money in the world so I could play with vineyards, plant vineyards all around, and, and learn all about them. Yeah. Well, it's so, going to happen and more and higher ed to to uh, help me with them. <laughs> well, yeah, and it's going to happen more and more in Washington. It's it's there's a lot more exploration to do here viticulturally. It's oh, fairly yeah. young. 
Yeah, we're just right, right at the start of it. We're, we're at the end of the birthing period, <laughs> really. So um, we, we've learned a lot extremely quickly to, um, to people that have come before us and to uh, have wonderful people like Ed move up here into Washington and, and help us. And, you know, Washington is different than, than California. And I think it's fun talking with Ed because uh, he's, he's always him, challenging himself uh, perhaps more than anybody I know to just really try to figure out Washington State and uh, his vineyard there, Stillwater Creek. And I, I admire that so much. And uh, so he has a lot to bring from the table that he's learned from the past and, uh, and, uh, and mix that with the observations he sees in Washington and uh, trying to help us grow better fruit here. So thank you very much, Ed. I really, really appreciate it. <laughs> uh, I wish I was in my 20s. I might be able to figure more out before I go. <laughs> I, 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 wish you, I wish you were in your 20s too and, and know as much as you do now. So, yeah, you're already a secret weapon. So, well, but, um, um, well Abby, uh, how are we doing here? Um, well, so we have uh, more questions? questions. If I can kind of run through please, those. Um, please do. Was, since you guys were talking about climate, um, how has the changes in the climate the last few years affected the grapes, in particular the Sanchio? Yeehaw. <laughs> sure. well, which, which, which vintage? Gosh, you know, we've had a couple of vintages that um, uh, took us back to the good old days, you know, 2010, 2011, took us back in time to, I want to say, the 70s and early, mid 80s. Um, those were very cool vintages. Uh, to me, those were a lot of fun. Uh, and uh, we have real elegant wines out of them. And to me, those kind of remind me of Eastern Washington where uh, you have to want to seek out the beauty and they're very uh, cognitive wines. And so they're, they're, they give you a lot to think about um, versus some of the warmer vintages, 15, 17. Uh, we, there's no question we've, you know, seen, uh, you know, warmer temperatures and with those temperatures, we've seen bigger, bolder wines. Um, they certainly uh, are very impactful wines, but um, I don't know if there is complex necessarily. Um, so, but I think with what I'm really looking forward to in the future anyway is in seeing where our climate goes is seeing other opportunities for vineyards throughout Washington State and playing around with different, uh, more different elevation levels in different growing regions. And um, so not only do you get different soil makeups, but just climate wise and, and what uh, grapes you can can grow in those areas. So um, San Giovese in particular, it likes warm, dry heat. It doesn't uh, use as much water as some of the other grapes. Um, but, um, you know, it's a late, late ripening, so it needs a long, longer growing season. You got to be protective of frost. We just had, we did have an early cold spell here two weeks ago. Uh, gave us a little bit of a threat. In fact, I was walking around some or riding my bicycle just two, three days ago and uh, saw some vines that have been cut down to the uh, ground here, even though that's not uh, the Royal Slope. But uh, it did get, uh, there's a couple vineyards down low in low pockets that got hit real hard two weeks ago and our temperatures were, I know that some areas got as low as 23 degrees two weeks ago. <laughs> so, um, but uh, all our vineyards here in this area um, didn't have any damage, thank God. So, um, but yeah, as far as that goes, like I can see, it's important that that San Giovese, I think there'll be more sites opening up with uh, provide longer uh, growing uh, seasons anyway that uh, San Giovese likes. Um, so, 
Would you guys say that Sandia is an up and coming wine in Washington state or is it more of a fad or are we just talking about it and making it seem more popular? No, I, my opinion is, is it can grow well on the right sites, the right, the right places. Um, I don't think it's going to take over Washington grape growing um, in the wine industry anytime, but it, you know, Washington State, the beauty of Washington State is, is um, what we're good at is that we can grow so many different varietal, varietals um, or varieties exceptionally well. And um, so finding those spots, it, there's a lot more uh, sites that will grow uh, good Cabernet Sauvignon than San Giovese. Uh, that's just the way it is. But um, I think as people get more adventurous, is, it'll be fun, fun to see. So another Italian varietal, um, you know, Nebbiolo, uh, you know, that's just a, that's just a tough one to grow and uh, to grow to the point where, I mean, anyway, that, there's just lots of, I don't, I don't think San Giovese, it's, it's here to stay. Um, I think we'll see some growth in it, but it's not going to become one of the big majors. I don't believe. And I know you guys have kind of touched on this a little bit, but how does Washington's Tawar impact San Giovese versus California and versus Italy? And are there other areas where um, San Gio is grown? Well, Ed has, you know, he lived and worked in Italy. But, you know, what's really cool, I think about Italy, gosh, I, you know, the, the soils over there are really, the moral and uh, it's just it's just really uh, incredible in the steep hillsides, at least in the areas that I was at. Uh, it's fun. It's it's a religion there, you know. And uh, and the way that they approach the growing uh, in the area that I was at, um, it is it, it's a lifestyle. They're, the I mean towns and the, they're seemed like their lives a lot of their a lot of the townspeople's lives just uh revolved around the vineyard and uh, it's absolutely wonderful so um i don't think we're going to get to that point here um but um ed do you want to touch on that well it's almost like any variety compared um it has its places it likes to grow and you have to have the love of growing it, the love of making it, and the people who want to drink it. And it will not grow in some areas of California. It has its microclimates and the same thing here. And so it basically comes down to who wants to make it because we can grow it here and then figure out how to grow it in the best way possible here. Every site is an independent study within every site within Washington Washington is different than California and California is different than Italy and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a hard question to answer. It just, you have to do your due diligence. Can I grow San Giovese? Can I not? If I can grow it, well, what are the good clones here? Well, you know, we'll have to learn them. Italy's had, a, it's their number one grape. They've had a whole lot of time to figure it out. We've been doing it, what, 15 years here, Chuck? <laughs> well it's still water but, but yeah yeah versus, well we've been doing yeah. it 20 years we but we haven't been growing it that long and we're still in our diapers on learning it but we obviously can grow it here so yeah it, and you touched to, on a huge point and that is who's going to consume it you yeah know, it's, it's do people want it we can grow it here you can grow it in italy in italy it's religion um i've grown for a lot of italian guys down in california and it's religion there too for them but it'll have a limited marketability um so and it's like other varieties you know we have our main fighting varietals that everybody will want but it's just learning how to grow it here and doing a good job with it when we do get the right clones get the right wine making I mean, it really is an old variety with a very young history on making 
really great wines out of it. It's just been a wine that's been blended with whites and reds forever. Yeah. Now we're now we're just we're giving it street creds. You know. We're, yeah, and I do, and I do see a lot of variation. There's vineyards where I'll see okay they grow great cab they might grow great merlot and all these different uh, vineyards, but the Sangiovese tends to vary even that much more uh, between vineyards and sites. So I think size is so much is so extremely right. critical with San Gio. Yeah, it's like a Pinot Noir. It'll grow very different in each location, flavor-wise. Um, Viognier has different flavors depending on whether you're growing it in the Sierra foothills in the Columbia Basin or, you know, Napa and Sonoma or wherever you're growing it. You know, the weather data, the soils, it'll change its structure. Um, Sauvignon Blanc very different depending on its climate. So it's just one of those that it's it's a hard question to say how does it differ. Um, the San Giovese same clones that I grew in California had very different cluster morphology. Um, whether I could grow it in an area where I had a lot of rain and could drive and could not irrigate during the summer, different cluster morphology. Um, different soils, different mineralities. So it's really difficult to compare. I mean, you'd have to just be a student of San Giovese and, okay, I'm gonna go taste Napa, and I'm gonna go taste Sonoma, and I'm gonna go over to Italy, and then I'm gonna go to Stillwater, then I'm gonna go Red Mountain. You know, they'll all have distinctions to them because of their 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 morphology really in the different places, the climate and morphology of the, the vines and grapes. Yeah, welcome to the study of, of wine. <laughs> yeah, so, but it, 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 it really is a more interesting wine in that way than a lot of others. It's just, it's, it's a chameleon. It just changes oh. from where you are. Absolutely, yeah. So I you sound like a politician answering that one. I didn't really get an answer. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so I have a couple more questions here. Um, is there a Washington equivalent of like Chianti in the sense of blending? Um, I haven't seen anything. I think, you know, Washington winemakers are so independent and in, uh, in doing their own styles. Um, so you see a lot of super Tuscan type blends, if you will. Um, you see 100% San Giovese, but I don't see anything that's, if anything's dominant, uh, yeah, gosh, yeah. I, I don't see a dominant well, trend. Even there. the counties are changing how they're making San Giovese. That's completely different than it was a few decades ago completely different yes so they're changing the way san Giovese is used all over the world i've seen it with 70 percent sangio and 30 percent cab i've seen 80 percent with 20 percent merlot i've seen people actually mix it with syrah blend it with syrahs and that's what i love about washington they do weird stuff and it's can sometimes be really good. Well, when I, when I was in uh, Chianti Classico last year, I, I saw all of those. Uh, all of those were there. And what was harder, more difficult to find are the classic Chiantis. Uh, like I say, with the Caniolo and the Colorino. And, um, you know, They're moving away from those. That. They are, sadly. But I tell you, I just absolutely, the few that I found, uh, I just absolutely loved them. I, so um, I, I hope they don't lose it all. <laughs> I, lo I love the tradition, partly because it's just so different from what we see here. The others are becoming more similar, I think, to, uh, to what, what we see here. So um, I like to see Italy maintain its tradition. You know, another, we, hmm? I was going to say, when we talk about comparing them to regions, People keep asking me how I look at a lot of varieties compared to California, but the way I look at all these, 
because I've been around so long. I've seen the first the first vineyard trellising systems that were 12 foot wide rows and eight feet between the vines because I'm an old guy. Um, we've changed all this stuff and you just, still Water Creek Vineyard, I'm gonna take San Giovese and I'm gonna play with it and keep trying to make it better and better and better for where I am. If I'm on Red Mountain or Waterloo Slope, I might grow it differently. Each site is an independent study, and our goal as a viticulturist and winemaker is to do the best we can with it wherever we are. And it's it's completely independent sites and independent studies. And that's the best way to look at viticulture is it's, yeah, you want to make comparisons. That's a fun study, but let's do the best we can do where we're at with it what we have absolutely um how long will sangio age uh, we have some people who've been drinking vintages as uh going back to 2010 um and it's still tasting great i'm glad to hear that you know it depends on the wine um there's a lot of sangios say four to seven years would be typical um, but you start getting into Brunella di Montecinos, Montepulcianos, uh, boy, you're talking 20 plus years um, and, uh, you know, 100% Sangiovese. So, uh, yeah, again, remember we were talking about the, the structure of the wine, the size of the berries and the phenolics and the balance in the wine, all of that contributes to it. The more we can more extraction out of the wine, the greater, bigger the chance of, uh, greater the chance of longevity. So. I'd like to make a little comment there for whoever asked that question is, I think the question to go with that question is to call your, the, the winery that you're buying from, ask them about the vintage, how they made it and and so if we've had a, a low tannin year, well, that year won't age as long. We've got to learn that there are vintages dramatically change the structure of a wine. Like 217 had very small cluster, small berry years. It's a once in 10 year vintage. And I'm guessing those wines will, at least for my vineyard, will age quite a bit longer because of the tannin structure. Um, did you pick it early with a higher pH? Then it'll it'll age longer. Yep, no lower lines. pH, lower pH. A little tighter too. They're, you can tell yeah. because they're they're tighter and it's taking more so time for them to open up. Every vintage will have a different aging character to it. And it also depends on how you like your wines too. You know, so uh, you got you must keep that in mind too. So oh, every, everybody has different ideas of what they think is uh, over the hill in that, so. Uh, in the last five or six years, what would you say was the best Sangio? Um, I would say Kelly or Ed Kelly, uh, what was your favorite vintage? Um, and <laughs> I, I guess favorite wine, and I would throw in the non-vintage since we've released that within the last five or six years. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I have an answer I always give to that. I love all vintages. I love all vintages. And people, whenever I talk about grape growing, just go, oh, no, come on. And I always say, do you, do you have kids? You may not, you, you, you love them all the same. You may not like them all the same. But <laughs> I love all vintages because I know what the year threw at me. I. Okay, started off hot. I'm going, okay, well, I'm setting my canopy up for high. Oh, July I started, got cold and did this and that. So I hit my brakes, changed my viticulture. I just know what goes into it. I know how I react. And I contact wineries and tell them what I think. And then I just like to watch what happens with it. But um, so it's a really difficult question for me to answer. But at first, I'd say 217 was a lovely vintage. 215 was an interesting vintage. I thought 216, you know, may have been 
not as intense as others because we had bigger clusters and bigger berries and you know all these things we've been talking about this evening but 216 is opening up and becoming quite lovely i mean the fruit characteristics are pouring out of it so yeah, and that's a good example. And I'd say that 16s aren't going to age like the 17s right. are going to. And so, so my, my response to that in a way is become a student of the vintage. As a wine drinker, become a, look at what the year is doing. Was it hot early? Was it cold early? Is it, you know, talk to Chuck. What, what's the cluster morphology? You've got big clusters, little clusters, big berries, little berries. They change year to year. Vintages are a real thing. <laughs> and we don't pay enough attention to vintages. And love yeah, each vintage for what it is and study what it is so you can enjoy how the year came out in the wine. That's and my when response you, to it. I love them all. Just and when you and not only that, it gives you the knowledge of how to react to vintage when a similar vintage. Uh, may come around in the future too. Maybe so. one thing we can start doing for your 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 wine members here to check is take more pictures during the year. I just showed you bud break. Mm -hmm. Let's let's take pictures, show you what cluster morphology looks like, a little description of it. I keep a lot of phenological data, and I've I've given some viticultural talks in the past in Novelty Hill and a few others where I go through all this, but. That's on what do we do in the vineyard to make wine quality. But to me, I'm, to me, a very interesting subject would be let's let's talk about the year's vintage. What was the phenology of the year? How many heat units? What happened between bud break and bloom? What happened between bloom and verasion? What happened between verasion and harvest? What did the year throw at us? What did we do? When did the hell hit us? What did it do when the hell hit us in July 12th, 2012? You know, yeah, that's well, the exciting you, part of grape growing, wine making, and wine drinking, is just to understand what goes on every year and taste it in the wine. You, you set yourself up for a beautiful relationship between the three of us, Abby, you, and I. Abby's the one that's going to get all that information out to all of our well, wonderful but it, customers. It's just fun to do, and I think it's oh, what, it is. It's Absolutely. one of the things that's hard to do in Washington because. A lot of times the vineyards are, the wineries are very remote from the vineyards and it's hard for people to get out and see. So. Yeah, it's amazing just what we've seen the, just the last five days, you know, how much change is out there. The yeah, vineyards. 2020, very early bud break so far. Yeah. All the, all the varietals are popping out at the same time. You know, two Fridays ago, I went to vineyards, saw a little bud swell. Next week, I saw a bud break. By the end of last week, I saw a bud break in the whole vineyard. Bam. Very different year than 218, which, or 19, which is the same time was covered with a foot of snow, which is highly unusual. So vintage. Yeah. What happens? What's the phenology of the year? What happened from bud break? I look at the vineyards as four major benchmarks. Bud break, bloom, erosion, and harvest. And I like to look at what goes on between each one because it affects the quality of the grapes. It affects the decisions I make in the vineyard. And to some degree that affects cluster morphology and, and wine styles. So anyway. Um, so I have um, sparked people asking about specific vintages that they have. Um, because they've heard good things, it sounds like, from the 2016 and 2017 vintages. Should they be holding on to those or should they be drinking them now? Talk well, I, was, I, I would say with the 2016, um, you're not, I don't think you're going to hold it as long as the 17. The 17, I think, is a little closed um, at times. So I think uh, cellaring that for a little bit longer and enjoy those 16s now, I think, is... Uh, is a good way to go with that. Um, you were also asking the other question before, what are some of my favorite vintages? Um, you know, interestingly enough, that non-vintage Sangio that we did, uh, 
you know, there's so much fun in blending and everything, um, the different components complementing each other and creating a synergy. Um, and that non-vintage does that. Just, uh, I, I really love, love that. Um, the 2018, I think, is going to be a really, really wonderful uh, uh, wine, too. So, um, yeah. Wonderful. Um, and then people are also wondering if Sangria was a good wine to decant. Mm, it, again, it, it depends on the wine in, in the age of it. Canting is always a really interesting. If they're young and tight, like the 17s right now, yeah, I'd give a little bit of air to them. That'd be good. Um, if you have an older one, I it, again, it depends on the wine, but sometimes older wines can be so fragile and uh, the volatile so fleeting that sometimes you only get one pour out of it. Um, and you don't want to waste that in the decanter. So um, that one comes a little bit more from experience, but the younger, tighter wines, absolutely, man. Go at it if they're really tight. Yeah, give, give them a bunch of air. But, Sometimes Sangiovese can have a propensity to um, be a little more oxidative than other varieties. So you gotta be careful with that at times. Um, but for our wines, for the most part, I really, I've never seen, I haven't seen that issue. So, um, so yeah, younger, tighter wines, by all means, definitely if you can't get some air to them. So. Um, and then I'm getting down to kind of my final kind of group of questions. Um, we actually have a repeat question from our last tasting, um, which uh, we've had way more participants um, uh, today than two weeks ago. Um, is there a significant difference in corked versus screw capped wines and especially in aging ability? Well, for us that that is still to be determined. Um, but in general, um, the, there's a lot of variation with screw caps and the liners that they put in the top of the cap. And uh, so I've gone to using a tin liner in it um, just because it will preserve the wine better. Um, and so we'll see though. I mean, we like to say this is our, what I think our third vintage uh, using screw caps. So. Uh, we'll see, but you're kind of trading one problem for the other. Um, screw caps leads to more reduc reduction in wines, corks. You have your natural faults, TCA, TCB um, issues. So um, you're just kind of trading one, one for the other. And so the quality of the cork, the quality of the closure uh, is, determines a lot with it. So. Um, but I have not done a side by side. I mean, we have actually, we have some uh, cases of wine that have been corked and some screw cap, um, but we're not going to know the results of that at our winery for quite a few years anyway. So, um, but there's good results in both. Um, and I think with the caps, I mean, you're definitely seeing less, uh, you're not seeing the, you shouldn't be seeing TCA, not that TCA can't happen with a screw cap because TCA can come from other places other than the cork, it can come from the bottle, for instance. Um, I mean, did I say the bottle, it can come from the barrel. Um, so, uh, so you're not gonna see that, but you do see more reduction in the wine. So if a winemaker uh, makes their wine in a more, uh, reductive style anyway, you're, you're gonna see some bigger changes that might not be so pretty with a screw cap. So, a lot of it's winemaking style. Okay. No easy answer to that one. <laughs> um, so this is slightly unrelated, but what other grapes are challenging to grow? We've mentioned Sangio and Pinot and Nebbiolo and um, Carbonara is also, I know, pretty um, difficult. Um, what else do you guys find challenging? Um, in relation, for me, in relation to what we're speaking of with Sangiovese, P 
Pinot Noir is a tough one. You have to know your viticulture really well. And you have to do your due diligence for planting it in the right place, even more than San Giovese. Um, Viognier can be kind of interesting to grow. It's another one that if you overcrop it, you will change the fruit characters significantly. So you need to watch what you're doing. But all varieties, if you're going to make the best wines, are challenging to grow. Um, they just are. You have the more you know about growing each variety, the better that wine will be. They all have their own unique characters, characteristics. But um, and it depends on where you are. If you're in an area that's kind of wet, Chardonnay. Sauvignon Blanc are very challenging because they get rots and things like that. But taking all the pathology out of it, to me, are two hardest varieties to really grow or most challenging, I will say, are, are Pinot and, and Sangio. What about uh, Zinvindel and Primitivo? <laughs> I, that's not so challenging. If you're, you got to have the right location. I've grown a lot of Zinfandel and a lot of Primitivos. And as long as you know your viticulture is, it's, well, I've never found them all that challenging. <laughs> okay. San, I, San I've seen Lombard. some pretty nasty uh, vineyards of both. <laughs> yeah, but that's people don't know what they're doing. Yeah. Um, and I'll put it bluntly that way. Um, okay. Like I said, I was, in many ways on those old varieties trained by the old Italians. And if you crossed your T's and dotted your I's, everything was pretty good. But then the other tricks to all of them is how you manage your soils and your minerals. Foliars, drip applied, what are your proportions? When are you using them? At what rates are you using them? You can so dramatically change the quality of a wine by the way you grow the vines. So, but some some are just harder than others to grow their best. And Sanjo fits in there. How about, what about uh, Petit Verdot as far as uh, the Bordeaux go? I mean, I never worked with you had to bring your that up. Petit Verdot. But, uh, you know, depending on the vintage, and you know, Petit Verdot absolutely hates wind. You know, you get in a windy year and the canopy just becomes a bitch. And uh, uh, I, On um, Petit Verdot, I always say when Petit Verdot looks good, there's something wrong. I concur 100%. Yes. I've, you know, they've much improved the clones. It used to be that you get a, a harvest every, when I first started growing Petit Verdot back in the 80s, Every second or third year, you get a yield. We had problems in them, uh, a problem called collure, where the flower clusters would shrivel up, and turn brown before bloom time, and you'd have no crop. The next year, you'd have one or two clusters of vine. Then the next year, you'd have this big yield. Um, microvi microviruses, they had all kinds of weird things, but Petit Verdot's Petit, I, it's you need a warm climate. Um, I think yeah. our Petit Verdot is really good at still water, and we're not as warm a climate as we could be. But it's one that I crop down to two, two and a half tons an acre when I grow it. So it's because I'm a cooler climate, I keep the yields very low, and the canopy can look ugly as sin, and the grapes turn out beautiful. Exactly. They just get battered by the wind and the leaves just look like hell. And uh, and it's really interesting because sometimes I think more than any varietal, that vine just, the vine itself and the canopy tells me when it's time to harvest. Because it's such a late ripener right. and uh, you just pretty much, <laughs> most years just have to leave it out there as long as you possibly can until the plant shuts down. Yeah. Then it's time to harvest. So Pretty much. I, I just pulled six acres of Petit Verdot out of my vineyard. I still have seven. And I'm actually thinking of playing around with a couple more Sangiovese clones. 
Yeah. So. Yeah, I, I the comment though about it, if it, the canopy looks good, it's not good petit verdot. That is, year. that if has my, been my, my petit, experience. If my petit verdot looks good, I'm worried about the whole vineyard. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but the same token, I've seen it where the canopy just gets so beat up and, uh, you know, it's fragile. It doesn't like that wind. Um, you know, the canopy will look good for Petit Verdot and how you want it. And then all of a sudden, uh, the, the leaves just get so beat up. They say, I can't take this anymore and uh, give up the ghost and you're still a ways away. So, yeah, grow, growing Petit Verdot is a love-hate relationship. I, I absolutely love it. I mean, and I, you know, when Petit Verdot is good, it is just, oof, it's just such well, a beautiful I, wine. I like the wine. I like varietal Petit Verdots. It's just, mm -hmm. in a vineyard, I many times wish somebody else was growing it. <laughs> 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 it's like, you know, I'm, I'm uh, getting a certain amount of pleasure in pulling out this one block. <laughs> <laughs> But I do love Petit Verdot. Misbehaving vines, I love it. Well, you know, it's yeah. kind of like me. It's a crusty variety to grow. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy, Abby, any more questions? <laughs> um, so first off, I just want to um, say I know it's a, almost a quarter to eleven for all of those on the East Coast that have been tuning oh. in really appreciate for those who kind of made it this far into the Tuesday evening. No um, kidding. What troopers? Um, I, let's wrap it up by talking about food and wine. Um, a lot of people have been drinking um, their Sangio tonight with the obvious Italian food and pizza. Some have been doing fish tacos. And I know, Chuck, you like to refer to this as the sushi wine. Oh, <laughs> well, not for eating it with sushi. <laughs> the only reason why I refer to it as a sushi wine is because, like sushi, Sangiovese, it has to be, you know, close to exceptional, you know, it's got to be really good or why bother? So that's how I feel about Sangiovese. So, but as far as food pairings, uh, you know, gosh, it's just, uh, again, it depends on the style of wine. Yeah, there's just so many different uh, styles to make Sangiovese in, and we've experienced two of them here today. Uh, the rosé, uh, you know, great with uh, uh, young, soft goat cheeses, chev. You know, I just think of, I love spinach. I love when springtime comes around or early summer, and uh, you know, spinach salad with a little chev and uh, some fresh fruit involved on there. Uh, Excellent. You start getting into like the 2018, any kind of Italian food. If we go on down over to Cugini's, uh, anything that Michelle makes, man, this is going to go great with. Uh, but it's a good all around wine. Um, I would even, you know, um, I was going to say, yeah, actually, I'm going to pull that one back. <laughs> I was going to say, even even with salmon, sometimes it, uh, this could go. But I think this guy it depends on how you prep your salmon. Whether this would uh, well, if you use a tomato, like if you use a tomato sauce with your salmon, it will go. Yeah, Angelis yeah. loves tomatoes. Yeah, anything tomatoes, absolutely right. So, so. You, yeah, you can't not going to go too wrong with uh, using Sangiovese with anything. But uh, yeah, this could even even some you know grilled red meats and stuff. This one would be would just fine with. So, but yeah, Cuginis all the way. <laughs> Sometimes in the summertime on a warm night, when I got my tomatoes kicking in the garden, I'll just slice my tomatoes thick and. A little olive oil, a little oregano, a little vinegar on there. Yeah. Maybe an yeah. anchovy. Not always. Yeah. And Sangiovese go good with that. Yeah, it, mozzarella. Mo yeah. A little buffalo, a little buffalo cheese, man. Man, that's that's great. It's good by itself too. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> that it is. Okay, any any further questions, Abby? No, that about wraps it all up, doesn't it, Abby? Is that the end of the Abby notes? That is the end of the Abby notes. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> awesome, awesome. Well, everybody, I thank you so much, Ed. I just want to thank you for joining us. Uh, your knowledge is just incredible and in giving us insight into Stillwater Creek and uh, your knowledge of San Giovese and just your whole experience in the world of uh, grapes is uncomparable, I think, just about. So um, it's been a real treat having you join us and I can't thank you enough. So uh, yeah, look for some more great wine coming your way. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, thank you very much for inviting me to participate in this. It's always fun to talk to people. I mean, we're out here growing grapes and making wine, but you know, we're doing it for all the wine drinkers of the world, including ourselves, and it, it's just kind of fun. This is what makes it fun is chatting about it, especially in this day and age. It's, Absolutely. It's, it's good to have all the communication, so thanks to everybody listening in. Yeah, well, you, you look pretty isolated there in your, your A-frame up there near Lake Wenatchee and a beautiful spot, and, uh, so... Thank you for reaching out and uh, being a part of this. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you very much. All right, everybody. Well, thanks again. Take care and see you in two weeks. And remember, <laughs> just enjoy a bottle of wine yeah. every day. <laughs> Maybe every two days. Anyway, um, no, just remember, just keep wine keeps us together wine is part of uh, our culture and uh, over time there's one thing that food and wine always seem to bring people together and nowadays we can say zoom too <laughs> zoom brings us together so thanks again everybody take care ed will be chatting soon and uh, all of you thanks again and uh, thanks for spending your time with us so take care look forward to seeing you all soon Hopefully in person. <laughs> that would be nice. Bye, it everybody. It would be nice. Take care.